Welcome back to Lost in Rosha, the ultimate journey through the Stormlight Archive. I'm Christian Kremling. And I'm Jimmy Stormblast, coming in hot uh, for another episode of Lost in Roshar. Today, we are diving into Chapter 62 and 63 of The Way of Kings. If you've not read the Stormlight Archive, you're a loser, and you should get out of here. Everyone else, welcome back, and we're glad to have you. My new thing is I'm trying to insult everyone who isn't a part of the in-group. You know what I mean? I want to really make a dynamic where people feel left out mm. and they feel pressure to continue reading the Stormlight Archive so that they can then listen to Lost and Roshar. Does that make yeah. sense? Is this strategy? Yeah. yeah, I feel like we don't gate, gatekeep enough. I feel I like agree. this is way too wholesome and positive. I And maybe we need a bit of toxicity to uh, you know increase toxicity the view. Toxicity of our city. All right, Serge. Here he comes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me on about Sister but Down. I'm ready to what go. What a banger album, though. Oh, Toxicity, oh my man. Hello, high school. Takes me back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, dude, hopefully we're only with the Stormlight fans now and all these other, you know, plebs have left because <laughs> there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about. And we've had a week off because yeah, Dune off, 2 yeah. came out and Jimmy and I said, you know what? Podcast, schmodcast. I'm going to Arrakis. Yeah, and, it was basically uh, <laughs> either I cancel my IMAX Dune 2 tickets or we record was basically what it came down to. And uh, folks, I'm sorry I didn't choose you over Dune 2 and IMAX because that that thing was sold out for like five days. And I was like, I, I got it. I got this special time. My wife ended up actually buying the tickets ahead of time and surprising me, which was really cool. Um, man, ah, Dune 2 was awesome, dude. It was fantastic. I, you know, seeing the sand makes me think a little bit of Wave Kings. And yeah. just you can see that these otherworldly representations and events can absolutely be done in a way that feels like adult and mature and serious and fat, just absolutely out of this world. Right. Like it feels like you're literally on Arrakis when you're watching Dune 2. And I think that bodes really well for fantasy adaptations. And of course, you know, on this show, we talk a lot about Stormlight Archive being adapted or even Mistborn. And this gives me all the hope in the world. Yeah, I agree. Like for me dune shines most as like an experiential thing where you feel yeah. like we you feel fully immersed um for me like the characters and all that i'm interested but i'm not like really attached i'm just kind of like passively seeing where they'll go but mm -hmm. like the feeling of like these alien landscapes and just the technology it's so tangible and the lore is so it just feels so well realized that gives me that gets me real excited um, for the future of adaptations too. But like to, to be anything at this level is incredibly rare. Like it's this certain. is a, this is a massive feat. Well, um, let me say this. It's not even just rare for adaptation. It's rare for cinema. You know, with a lot yeah. of people say, is, is cinema dead? And we've seen a huge resurgence. Obviously Oppenheimer was huge. Actually, Barbie was pretty huge as well. But yeah. Dune 2, I, I don't know about you, but I went into it. I'm a Dune fan. Uh, I, I've read the first two books. I'm, I'm going to read the third one soon. And of course, I'm a, I'm a huge book nerd. You know, that, that mm -hmm. we're supposed to say, you know, we always love the books more. But, you know, I think that there's something to be said about what you can do in the cinema that you can do nowhere else. You know, there are are things that you can do in narrative and perspective and writing that cannot be done mm. you know a lot of inner monologue i know some shows and movies do it but it's very good in books well i think seeing dune on screen reminds us the strengths of cinema and what that can be and i think it's a bit of a, a heresy for me to say this as a book lover but the conversation of well was it was it, you know, uh, faithful to this line in this book? I don't necessarily know if I care about that as long as the adaptation is embracing the strengths of the mediums that it's being displayed in, whether that be television or movies, because they are different. Hmm. Um, th that just makes me kind of excited to see a rendition of something like Stormlight, you know, on a big screen or, or a small screen if it ends up being television. But I don't hmm. know, man. It felt like cinema. Again, it felt like going for the first time for Lord of the Rings or honestly, Interstellar is one I always think about. Yeah, uh, this was something I, I will probably be talking about the rest of my life when people bring up movies. Yeah, it's been one of my favorite cinema experiences as well. And like, yeah, you can read the voice being used in the book, but like having your chest mm -hmm. rattle, um, hearing that in the cinema is totally, totally, <laughs> totally different. And I was just like, oh, imagine the Stormfather's voice, but it'll yeah. never be. A movie i think the stormlight archive just can't be a movie um but it would be really cool to see this level of care and attention to detail and i agree with you that 
if they don't have the lines exactly or all of this, like that's fine by me. Just capture the spirit of it. Take yeah. me to the same places and I'm cool, you know. Um, but like cutting out Dalinar as a, cal- as a character. Um, well, that might be a problem. See you later, mate. Yeah. But hey, uh, you know what? I'm you're always, fine. I'm yeah. always open. Yeah. You know, uh, I will give anything a fair shot if I feel like it's worth my time. But it's just something about that movie uh, and going to the IMAX and having my chest blown out (laughs) from the sound. (laughs) At some point, I I literally felt like I was on a sandworm. And I'm just like, you know, man, this is like the stuff that makes you happy you're alive. You know, I want to see the next event in cinema like that, dude. Straight up. It was incredible. It was incredible, man. What a what an experience and what a good uh, message for fellow people who want to adapt um, Stormlight specifically. Yeah, let's not make it sci-fi and fantasy. Stormlight, let's make it happen. Yeah, yeah uh, for sure. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if you did get 10 movies? Oh, oh my gosh. Wouldn't that, that be wild? Five hours a piece. But yeah. to be honest, like we talked about Earthbringer a little bit before the show. Could use some condensing, you know? Wouldn't mind a bit of condensing. Oh, there, there will have, even in television, there will have to be. Oh, and yeah. that's okay. It's that's totally okay. fine. Rhythm of War will be two episodes. <laughs> yes and and there's a lot more that you can get across visually that will last as an impact rather than having to maybe repeat scenes and lines oh, yeah Kaladin struggle would be an example of this i think that you could really relay some of that stuff on screen a little bit differently but uh you know what kind of does make me a little bit sad is a lot of times adaptations come decades after something is done and mm. knowing that stormlight will be finished and we'll be like 60 Oh, we man. might not be around oh. for the proper adaptations, which would be kind of sad, right? Just imagining like uh, our our podcast in the dusty recesses of the internet. And they, they find us, these two guys that were hyped for the adaptation and they never got there. Wow. Yeah, people will be like, they would have <laughs> loved it. Jimmy would have had a stupid criticism about it, but man, Christian would have loved it. <laughs> Jimmy, um, like they made Tefta ma- main character. Jimmy, um, okay. Jimmy would have died. <laughs> Maybe that's what kills you. You find out Teft is the new protagonist. I just, I just stroke out. <laughs> um, I stroke out after watching the YouTube announcement. <laughs> but speaking of YouTube announcements, great, great job there, mate. You've set me up for the segue. Um, the 631 reveal has happened. Sanderson stared into our souls, slapped down the um, slapped down the manuscript. New secret project as well as the words of Radiance Leatherbound. Jimmy and I threw our money at the screen. For the leather mm-hmm. bound. But, you know, future Cosmere, we respect it. But if I'm honest, I kind of felt pretty neutral. And I know that's a real hot take, especially on my side of this podcast. What did you feel, Jimmy? Um, yeah, so we all knew an announcement was coming. The words of Radiance Leather Bound, there were some people saying, hey, it's probably just going to be that. And I was like, it's Brandon Sanderson. It almost is never just that. Uh, and by the way, really, really happy with what it looks like that we're getting oh. for the words of Radiance Leatherbound looks really amazing. And it just, yeah. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Uh, I did end up adding the add on for the physical copy of the new secret project because I would maybe like to resell it. Down the line. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> um, but as far as like being hyped up about it, no, not, 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 not terribly. Uh, there's, there's something about whatever it's like big Cosmere connections. And, I know this is weird, but it almost feels daunting to me where I'm like, oh, no, it's something else I ha- like. I have to read. Like, I'll feel obligated to read it. And I'm not saying it. it I'm saying it's not going to be good or whatever, but it's just like it's a little overbearing at times, like knowing yeah. how much stuff I have to read, especially because I read so many other things other than, you know, Cosmere. Um, mm. it, it, it can feel like a lot. Um, at what point do they become not secret projects and they're just more books that he's working on. You know what I mean? Cause like, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of authors that will work on something and not really talk about it until the publisher agree. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like at what point do secret projects no longer become secrets? It's a trademark now. I mean, it's just, yeah. has, you have it's to a great marketing that. tactic. It's oh, for sure. There's no one better that marketing. Yeah. Oh, he's, I mean, Hey, I was right about the spread plushies or whatever it you was. Were right. <laughs> They're there. The spread plushies have arrived. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't mind a spread plushie. I'm not. I was gonna say, I, I felt like that's something you would like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jimmy. That's a <laughs> that's a dagger to the heart with a smile. Yeah, on your dweeb. Face. <laughs> um, look, he's he's going for it. Good on him. But um, it's all about that leather bound for me. Words of rating to such a special book to me, and to have it yeah, dude. Um, presented so beautifully is um, great, awesome. But yeah, look, the secret projects, look, I think you got to join me in my mindset. We are two scholars on Roshar. 
In all other books, a fuel for our knowledge, and the stories are bonuses. You know, it's like if you want the story, go get the story. But like, we just go research the law, take what we need, and we come back to Rosha. You know, and I know that's really not the way these books are intended to be. But I feel like I'm like the Stormlight Theory guy, and I'm okay with that being my. It takes the pressure off, to be honest, because oh, to sit through to sit through like thousands and thousands of pages of books when sadly my priority is like what law can i take from here to get to rosha um Mm -hmm. you know it makes it a bit more palatable not to say the books are bad but it's just like i know stormlight hits for me and not all other sanderson hits for me um so it's what gets me through some of the ones that are a bit i'm a bit more lukewarm on like mistborn era 2 um Mm -hmm. but i'm still glad i read it because there was some really standout moments for me in that series um so yeah i'm excited for it but it's not like the top of my to be read yeah i think it falls in the sunlit man category for me being yeah. in the future and you know um i'm a little apprehensive towards any hints at stormlight from the future um mm-hmm. i know that he's not going to spoil his 10 book magnum opus series i'm aware of that but at the same time like i don't even want a hint of, of maybe something that's coming or happening or a red herring or any of that really. Um, but now that we do this show, maybe, maybe I, I will, I'll feel differently and feel like I need to comment on it. But I mean, certainly a uh, good time to be alive. If you're a Brandon Sanderson fan, I mean, if you like everything the man does, this is, this is just as good as it gets for you. Yeah. He, he's delivering so hard. Um, he knows yeah. what the, what the fans, well, I don't know if what well, he knows what the fans want, but I think he's doing it for himself. Like the the Cosmere is his, it's his massive project. Like, let's go. I think that's, I think that's great. Like, um, the more Cosmere we get is probably better. Um, but there is a limit of like, when does this get too big? Like you could see it getting bloated, especially if you start adding more authors and then it becomes, it will potentially have the, it get into the realm of homework. Um, but maybe that's also our mindset. I think we're just so tied up in Stormlight. We just want Stormlight to some degree. Yeah. Um, but I like the idea of more entry points. I Don't like you? more entry points. I like, mm. I, I admire ambition, even if it's something I'm not super duper interested in, which is like reading like every single thing. Uh, I always admire an artist trying to go big and for their vision and unapologetically doing so. So, you know, yeah. more power to them. I think at this point, it, I feel pretty confident saying that I think the Cosmere is going to live way past Brandon Sanderson and it's going to be something that people are working in for a very long time. And I think that he has set up dragon steel to be an entity, you know, that's going to live on. So one, it's going to solidify his, his legacy was already solidified. Let's be honest, but even more so solidifying it. And I think that it's going to, you know, provide opportunities for new authors and, and things actually, you know, one thing it kind of reminds me of, and it, it they are very different things, but, there's another thing that's kind of like provided people an outlet and give people connections. And that is wild cards by George R. R. Martin. Mm. Uh, a lot of people joke about them now because it's like George R. R. Martin's <laughs> releasing another wild cards novel. Everyone's like, Meh. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people wrote in those earlier ones that were either cutting their teeth or were big names like Robin Hobb wrote some for it. Uh, Daniel Abraham, uh, Maybe I think Tad might have. Th- there's been a ton of authors is my, yeah. is my point. Uh, and that's kind of cool uh, to give people this kind of sandbox to come in and have interconnected novels and all this stuff. Now, the Cosmere is a much wider project, bigger and and totally different, really. But kind of the same idea uh, yeah. in, in my head. So, you know, I think, uh, like I said, if if you like everything the man does, you're eating good. Yeah. It's the connected universe um, issue, right? pros and cons mm-hmm. to this whole thing and like the bigger you get the more you get like pockets of what like almost different fandoms so i don't really True. i always get a bit frustrated with um cosmere being related to the mcu even though i've done that before because it's just an easy comparison point but think of the mcu or just like marvel comics in general like some people will love one mm-hmm. hero and one storyline and really dislike another um and i think it's going to get to that point and that's that's all right i think it's just we're in a transitional period where i think we're all kind of on the same page up until about <laughs> miss born era two and that's where the crack started to show where some people liked this um new direction and other people just like give me warbreaker stormlight and and a miss born era one and i'm and i'm happy and elantris i guess 
Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's getting very, I like, it feels a lot more colorful with these secret projects. I feel like the Cosmere has a lot of different corners to visit. Yeah. Different tones. I mean, yeah. in, in, in a universe, I guess that would make sense that there would be that much variety. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, those are all good things. Um, mm. So yeah, that's the Sanderson update. I think for for this week, we've ordered our leather bounds, and uh, we're going into the future, in the future, in the past. Yeah. Future. Now I will say that the new secret project stuff is supposed to ship like mid twenty twenty five. So it seems like it might be a little while. If at least that's what I read. Mm-hmm. Um, now here's my question: Is this going to feature a character that we already know? I have no idea. There's like there's no real no. info on it yet. He's going to read okay. a chapter in a in a couple weeks. Uh, the opening chapter, so I suppose we'll gather who it is. I really wanted it to be the rock novella. Like I wanted the announcement to be like, you know what? I, I was going to delay the rock novella. Here it is before Stormlight Five. That would have been my like my um, perfect outcome to that six six three one. The rock novella was something that you and I were very excited about. I mean, we I think it, here's the thing. I love Don Shard. Like I really love Don Shard. And when I think back on Stormlight Archive and some of my favorite moments in the series, uh, I would put Don Shard in in that list. I really I don't know. I just I had a great time. I would like to know if other people feel this way. Um, mm. I would say in some ways I enjoyed Don Shard more than Rhythm of War, which is probably the most hottest take of all time uh, in Stormlight. But I think it's um, constructed way better than with Rhythm of War. Um, yeah. It's much more tightly. It just like. Um, well paced compared to Rhythm of War. It's a lot um, shorter, right? It, it, it doesn't yeah. have to accomplish as huge of, of a feat as Rhythm mm. of War is trying to accomplish. So yeah, exactly. So the, the pressure's off a bit there. To be honest, I'd like to read Dawn Tread because I don't remember it. Weirdly, I don't remember it as well as I do Edge Dancer. I um, think you and I could have a lot of fun reading Dawn Shard. I, I think we could pull out a lot of stuff from it. I think if any if we reread anything before five Dawn Shard's probably the best one to do because it's got the most impactful information for for book five. Just by maybe itself. we should do that, dude. Maybe yeah. we should. I think that'll be good. Um, I was going to ask: Are we are we still doing Warbreaker after this book? Because we're getting to the tail end, and I just wonder: mm. Before Words of Radiance, are we going to dabble into Warbreaker? If we did it, I think. Yeah, you know, that is a good question. Um, mm. Maybe, hey, folks. <laughs> oh, didn't see you there. Hey, audience. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Let us, let us know. Do you want us to take a detour once we finish up The Way of Kings and read Warbreaker? Uh, we would not be doing a chapter by chapter breakdown, I don't think, right? No, we just do like a whole book, whole book yeah. discussion or something. Either whole book or maybe a part one, part two type yeah. deal. Like if we can find ways to split it up. I don't know if Warbreaker has like parts to it, but if it did, we could do it that way. Mm. Um, and try to see what we can pull out from it. But let us know, like, if if you want to. We're not in any rush. Like, we're not going to get through all five books, you know, no. or four books before book five. So me and Christian are looking at this as a marathon. So mm. I kind of like the idea, if I'm being honest with you. Uh, and also taking a break is never really a bad thing, in my opinion. So Palette cleanser, man. I love um, it. Like, I used too. to like Warbreaker. The longer I've gotten away from it, the more I've liked it. Yeah. I hope that stays when you read it. Um, but look, how about I put up a poll? I'll put up a poll on YouTube yeah. and I'll try the poll feature on Spotify. So Spotify Whoa. people scroll down. There's a poll there Beautiful. and, um, vote, vote for what you want. It sounds like we're doing it anyway, but vote anyway. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll listen. You know, if, if, if yeah. it's a resounding no, then we will not do it uh, yeah. or we'll probably do it, but do it at a different time. Yeah. Um, but we're just yeah. not in any terribly big rush but christian uh, mentioning polls on your channel you also released a uh, little storm live video last week in our absence yeah so last week while jimmy was enjoying dune part two and imax i worked on the next video in my Stormlight secrets and easter eggs series and another big push was i did the first episode of that the week prior because i just thought you know i need some content that i can just work on quickly three easter eggs or secrets bang 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 it's manageable rather than trying to like sum up Kaladin's 10 book arc, um, which took me way too long. And then I also got a comment that was like, um, yeah, this is really cool, but like you never continue any of the series you start on your channel. So like, I doubt we're ever going to get episode two and three. And that comment, were, it hurt so bad because he was so right. <laughs> I was like, yeah. But also it's free. So <laughs> yeah, there is that side. There is that side. But I was like, I always start 
things and never finish them. So I was like, oh, that's it. I'm writing a script right now. <laughs> and uh, I got my Shalan video up and I'm very happy about that. Well, not Shalan, the Devars. So short version, Shalan's mom's a herald. Second one was some Halaran stuff we spoke about on the pod where he could have been there to kill Kaladin. And three was Jimmy's amazing revelation that Nan Balat is being like, it's something magical is going on. So I took that and I ran with it. So if you want short form stuff, highly edited short form stuff, head on to Lost Great in production Great. quality. Thanks, man. But yeah, head on to my channel, check it out. And that's going to be, you know, I'm going to try to keep that consistent just to, just to build hype for Wind and Truth. Yeah, and I think it's also kind of a fun little challenge for you to keep it short, right? And to kind of hit on the finer points, get in, get out, and then you're done. And now you have a place to point people, right? When they're like, hey, what do you think about Shalon's mom? Oh, I have a five-minute video. Like, anyone can take five minutes out of their day. Yeah, yeah, it's nice and quick. And, it's, and it contains, because, like, man, going on the copper mind, you, it's, like, really hard to contain how much <laughs> you dive into a certain character. So yeah. there's so much more I could do to, like, prove to you that Shalon's mom is a herald, but... This had me just take the best points, throw it in. It's like, you take that and run with it. Cause I can't, yeah. I can't be here recording these giant videos every week. There's just not enough time. Um, so it's really fun. And, uh, I just need to get to episode four. So that comment is wrong. Um, and then we're good. And then I'll cancel the series <laughs> after episode four. <laughs> you're, like beautiful. you're just itching to cancel your product. You're like, yeah. I can't wait to graveyard this thing. Anyway, yeah. dude. We're pretty far into this thing. Maybe we should talk about the book. Yes, we should, we should get through these chapters. Uh, you know, hey, we had a lot of stuff to talk about. I think there's a lot of excitement uh, in the Stormlight sphere right now. I mean, with yeah. obviously five coming out and the we're, we're other brown stuff. So we want to give it its, its time. Um, before we do, I just want to say rest in peace to Akira Toriyama, the creator of Dragon Ball, uh, for no other purpose other than he greatly impacted me. And I may not have found other fantasy stories if it had not been for him. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure there are at least some Dragon Ball fans that are listening out there. So rest in peace to the big man, uh, and say hello to King Kai for us. So rest in peace. There will yeah. definitely be a lot of Dragon Ball fans. I haven't read Dragon Ball, but I would watch it in the mornings getting ready for school uh, as a primary school lad. And I can see, I mean, I know of the insane influence that has had on not only manga, but like fantasy in general. Yeah. It's I mean, really incredible. It's yeah, it's actually hard to put into words how influential it's been. Uh, and I would love to see if Brandon Sanderson likes Dragon Ball because sometimes I get a little bit of Dragon Ball. Oh, dude, the, the ideals and leveling up and Stormlight that's mm -hmm. like let's that's straight out of Dragon Ball, <laughs> that's straight out of it. <clears throat> well, we got uh, some leveling up here. The, the Bridge Four crew is both of our chapters today, and yep. we're gonna go ahead and do the epigraphs, chapter 62 and 63. Chapter 62 is named The Three Glyphs, and the epigraph is as follows, or the death rattle, I should say. Uh, the darkness becomes a palace. Let it rule. Let it rule. Kakeva, 1173, 22 seconds pre death, a dark eyed Seleman of unknown profession. Mate. Okay. So I think that the darkness becomes a palace is the scene where Elokar is it Elokar? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. there. That's what yeah, this is. yeah. His his wife has been inhabited by an unmade, yeah. and the whole palace is full of debauchery. Yeah, I reckon that's it too. I did it. I yeah, did it. yeah. Look at you, Jimmy. Full marks. I'm so out of ten. All right, chapter sixty three. <laughs> Fear. Uh, and the, the death rattle is as follows. I wish to sleep. I know now why you do what you do, and I hate you for it. I will not speak of the truths I see. Kakasha, 1173, 142 seconds pre-death, a shin sailor left behind by his crew, who reportedly for bringing them ill luck, sample largely useless. Why is that useless, Jimmy? There is a reason. Do you know why? No, I don't know why. Why? Ooh, because... It, this guy is cluing into what the silent gatherers are doing. He's like, I want to die. I know what you're doing. And I'm not going to tell you the truth I'm seeing right now. All right. I'm not going to say my death rattle. I'm going to die. So that's oh. like, <laughs> how cool Dude. is that? How nice is that? That is dope. And what a great part of the book to put it in, you know, as we're going through these, like, Oh, this one means this. This one's predicting this. And then you yeah. get a guy that's like, hey, hey, wake up, wake up. They're doing this to me. Help, help, help. You know, this is crazy. 
Yeah, it's like, I wonder what he saw. He's like, you know what? I'm seeing some crazy stuff. And now, now I saw the end of the yeah. series. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we should go over chapter 62, Three Glyphs. Yep. Uh, this is obviously from the Caledon POV. Uh, Caledon Bridge 4 on another bridge run. He's nervous because this time he wants to try distancing the Parshendi archers with his self-made Parshendi armor and shield. On the way to the battlefield, a soldier who doesn't want to wait for the army's water crews tries to force his way to Bridge 4's water skin. Because Caledon's armor is hidden with the water, Bridge 4 persuades the soldier to back down. On the final approach, Kaladin merges, manages to draw the full attention of the Parshendi archers by wearing Parshendi armor and shield. He uses Stormlight to improve his speed, heal his wounds, and draw arrows to his shield. Sadius rides up and is forced to promote Matal because his, in quotes, idea of distracting the Parshendi worked. Kaladin himself suffers from the shock after using so much Stormlight. As always, the members of Bridge 4 look for wounded from the other bridge crews and care for them. Suddenly, Lopin calls out as he spots a group of Parshendi archers coming back to the chasm and aiming at Bridge 4. While the men try to escape out of range, they are surprised to see Dalinar dashing into the Parshendi force and striking them down. When done, Dalinar raises his blade in a salute to Bridge 4. Epic. Yeah, that moment good. was so sick. Yeah, good stuff. Dal- the Dalinar Kaladin relationship has begun, and uh, real recognize a- real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, game recognize game right there. Mm-hmm. Um, man, that moment was so satisfying. Um, and I'm glad you recapped it because I read this two weeks ago, and I needed a little recap. This chapter was really well executed in the sense of seeing how bad what Kaladin is doing is to the Parshendi. You like realize how, just yeah. how bad it is. Um, is this the one? Yeah, it is this one. When Lopin actually doesn't call him Gancho, he's like, dude, Kaladin, we're, we're going to die right now. And um, when Lopin gets serious, that's when you know things are going down. Yeah. Um, it's fun to finally see some Stormlight being used, man. Kaladin's using all his tricks. Yeah, this is uh this is the first real big demo, I think, of, yeah. of, yeah. of these from my powers. But in an, other ways, it's also big for the characters. Like you said, Lopin gets serious, which is always mm-hmm. a great uh, switch to flip on a character who is usually humorous. Uh, that can change the whole feel of a chapter whenever they're in the scene. And he also has a ton of cousins, which <laughs> which we yeah. learned. You're like, man, you really do have a lot of cousins, Lopin. That's crazy. <laughs> but uh, for Kaladin, you know, this is Kaladin stepping up. But it's also weird to think about him as being kind of an antagonist once you have all of the context of the situation. Because imagine you're at war and you see someone running with like your brother's skin on. Like you would be like, Yeah, that's messed up. Yeah. I mean, you would be irate. I mean, you would you would never stop until they're dead, right? Hmm. And like, I mean, Shen, it says the parchman looked up at him, face a mask of pain, tears streaking his cheeks. He looked at Kaladin and shuddered visibly, turning away, closing his eyes. I just felt so bad. I mean, this is I mean, it is insane to think about. Yeah, like Shen is like being mentally repressed because he's in dull form, but it like the emotions are breaking through because of how terrible this is. Like, yeah, he's wearing their freaking skin. Messed up. This reminds me of something I uh, just recently read in a song of ice and fire and i'm not going to go into it but like very kind of similar vibes about like maybe a big heresy type thing like this happening and then it causing a huge conflict but yeah i think this is i mean we have to look at this with all the context like this is a very disturbing and messed up moment from kaladin even though he's obviously ignorant to what what this is right but yeah and at first you're like oh cool they're using it as armor so nifty that's yeah, how one. resourceful of yeah. Bridge 4 to do such a thing. Um, I want to shout out Sassy Kaladin when they're Ooh. like, we're going to string you up. He's like, it's been tried, didn't work. Dang. Love that. Nice one, son of honor. Talk, talk about a, that's a Dragon Ball line right there. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's, <laughs> a, that's what I mean. That's the anime protagonist line. <laughs> that's the anime Kaladin that I love to see. <laughs> tried that, didn't work. <laughs> um, I talked to the Stormfather. Um, great, great stuff. Very satisfying. Um, and Dalinar at the end, his armor glowing as like, as, as all these Pashendi, um, archers are about to kill Kaladin and his friends. 
Daddy Dalina charges in, raises his blade as a sign of respect. Love it. Really cool moment. Oh. Adore it. I mean, yeah. Valinar's the man. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. In so many different ways. Uh, I have a friend reading through Earthbringer right now, and he's reminding me of all the flashbacks and stuff. I'm like, man, Dalinar really is just like the dude. Like, I love this character so much. Um, one thing I wanted to point out about this chapter, though, because we were talking about kind of like about characters. I mean, big moment for Dalinar here, and he's not even the POV, right? But yeah. Moash. Moash's uh, mm-hmm. character is even more flushed out here because we really see the differences between someone like Kaladin and Moash. And they both have their own motivations and reasonings for what they do, but they have different uh, philosoph- uh, philosophies about why they're doing what they're doing. And Moash is like, let's just charge at him, dude. Let's just go kill Sadius. We'll die, but like, we'll take a few out with us. Yeah. And Kaladin's like, no, you know, there, there's some there's some foresight there. Uh, and I also think that it's it's probably important to note that Moash seems to be completely against the three glyphs and any kind of deities or gods or religion, uh, whereas Kaladin says, you know, I'm feeling a bit nostalgic today. So as someone who has been faced with, you know, being a slave and in, in these, you know, downtrodden circumstances that are terrible, uh, Kaladin seems to be able to still have perspective of his past and, and keep some form of faith. Whereas Moash has kind of abandoned that. Um, yeah, we we see in the next chapter he's fueled by revenge, right? Yes. So he's like the antithesis to, to Kaladin the whole way through the series <clears throat> and now to a fully anime vibe of like... Oh, yeah, like, for sure. Like we started at the same high school and now we're enemies. <laughs> you know, that's the energy. Yeah. I mean, one well. of the things I like about Moash, though, is that you can trace everything he does back to his reasoning like he has reasoning for what yeah. he's doing i'm not saying it's right or we agree but he does feel justified in in, in his own perspective so i i think moash is a, is a good character because of that um mm. also you know i think that maybe sanderson's playing a little bit with religion here and faith uh knowing that he's a religious person i think he's trying to show the kaladin maybe a better example of someone keeping the faith rather than where moash is a filthy non-believer uh oh, interesting I, I kind of got that vibe uh, mm-hmm. from this, but maybe I'm reading a little bit too into it because me personally, if I was in the circumstance, I'd be a lot more like Moash than Kaladin. I think I'd be like, dude, why are you wearing those glyphs? Have you seen our lives <laughs> in the last year? You're out of your <laughs> mind, dude. Um, I'm fairly but, sure Kaladin grew up with his mom burning glyphs quite a bit. We've yes. seen that, haven't we? Yeah. That's so why he says probably, he feels nostalgic. He says, yeah, I'm feeling nostalgic. Yeah. It's that thing. It's like when you think about your childhood, whatever – your your mother did to comfort you it's like those things will forever be comforting yeah, slap like, me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just give me five across the face you know like, oh, thanks mom i got my head right now you know what? i can usually anticipate a jimmy <laughs> a jimmy wildcard line but i did not see that one coming <laughs> just like he didn't see the slaps coming but that's all right he's okay <laughs> he's okay um oh, but yeah man. I wanted to ask you this. I was I recently I recently um, hopped on the following Noah Don podcast to um, talk about Stormlight Five, and we they asked me about Moash and if he will get a redemption arc. And I wanted to ask your thoughts on this. Do you think we're going to get that? I think there will be an attempt. Right. That's all I got. Okay. Because I said I said no for book five, but maybe by the end of the entire thing because he oh, does say book five specifically no yeah okay, no, no, yeah. no 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 yeah no. back half of the series yes book five yeah. yeah i thought it was too early and i feel like there's i feel like him and kaladin will continue to get more weird and, and powerful and he'll take these these philosophical differences to a different level before they either yes. reach an understanding or not Moash is not done with his deeds yet. And and we actually see a huge step up in powered implications at the end of Rhythm of War whenever when he does the Hoid. So in mm. my opinion, I am get I am remembering this right, right? Because Hoid forgets his memories, right? Or my Yeah, my, but that's that's uh Tower of Engine doing that. It's Tower of Engine. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Moash ends up with a shard blade, right? Or am I am I crazy? Moash I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, I don't remember if he gets shot by. All right, but Cut um, this out. 
it's when the, it's not when you edit. <laughs> <'Cause> I <can't laughs> Dude, I can't remember either. We leave it in. We are humans. Uh, we're leaving it in. All right, we're good. leaving it in. No, he's like trying to stop um, Navani from activating the sibling or whatever. And Navani stabs him. He's like, "Life before death, you bastard!" And yes. like, he's kind of injured, and he kills Taft. So my idea is, is that he's going to kill Sill. That that that's where I was going. With this. <laughs> he's going for the big ones. Yeah, All I, right. I think. I think he he will kill Sill. Uh, hey, they just released a Sill plushie. She's she survived. Oh, and you know how fast it's gonna sell when she dies. <laughs> and with that, fear, chapter sixty three. Right? Is it? Done? Yes. Yes. Still uh, sitting here in this Kaladin POV. Uh, Kaladin tells Layton. Layton uh, to make Kara. I always, I always mess this up. <laughs> Kaladin tells Layton to make Kara space armor. Is it Kara space? Carapace. Carapace. You know what? Calden tells Layton to make armor for yeah. every member of Bridge Four. <laughs> Carapace. Except for sh- we're not. We're, we're moving past it. We're <laughs> done can't. with the word. As I have dyslexia, I'm sorry. It's uh, fine. It's it, it's rough out here. Uh, Kaladin observes spear practices and notices that <laughs> Moash is very skilled. Oh, he asks about his purpose, and Moash replies that he wants vengeance, but declines to say on whom. Kaladin and Rock discuss their plans to escape, while Teft asks Kaladin to teach the Bridgeman, but he declines, saying that he would become too eager and impatient. And Kaladin admits that he failed in the past, and that it got to him. So this mm. is a whole thing where Teft is kind of confronting Kaladin, saying, "I see your fear. I know you're worried about trying again. Basically, you do not want to fail again." But you have to step up and you have to do this thing. You have to be willing to fail once more, uh, which is really Kaladin's arc is him failing forward multiple and multiple and multiple times. Yeah, Teft is saying what he needs to hear in this moment. And I'm glad we're still getting like, I know people hate this, but I'm glad that after every small success, Kaladin still introspects and thinks I'm going to mess this up and this sucks and it's not worth it because that is that, that is the depression experience um yeah th- this like part of it is very with. relatable to me i i always i i've been at times in my life where i'm at the highest of highs and i've accomplished this goal i've worked years for you know i've had some monumental moments in my life where you know stuff i worked uh for came came true and i accomplished it and i always remember in those moments how sad i felt and being like you know, tomorrow it's all back to normal or mm-hmm. you know I, or you're gonna mess this up somehow like you'll ruin this moment somehow in the future and it's just a, it's a terrible thing to treat yeah. yourself that way. I find the highs very scary too because you're just like, okay, so all so I can do is low. fall down. Yeah, like I, there's yeah. only further to fall down, and it will be spectacular. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's the that's the terrible mindset you can get into. Um, the thing I did highlight was the somewhat on the nose foreshadowing of the Moash Kaladin experience. Um. He goes, sure, but there's a difference between us, Kaladin. Kaladin raised an eyebrow. You want to be able to save someone? Me, I want to kill somebody. And then um, he doesn't He doesn't go through it, but it's just like the basic the basic difference between these two and their mindset. And it kind of, it's so bad, but I got nostalgic for the the boy's plot to kill the king. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, bring it back. That was quite, that was quite <laughs> fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. There's just a lot of groundwork laid for Moash and Kaladin in these in these chapters, and I just feel like, like we said earlier, it's going to be a series wide dilemma, not just the first five books. Yeah, in mm. our opinion. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the distinction between the two and their motivations is is highlighted in these two chapters, without a doubt. Uh, one thing I wanted to note, Layton, who I talked about, uh, is based on a friend in Brandon's writing group named Alan. That is some trivia for you that I found on the 17th oh, chart cool. or copper mine rather because yeah, I cool. saw he's going to, uh, there's a term for it, but I'm forgetting. Um, but there's a competition for you to, to get put in as like an extra in stormlight. He, he adds you in hmm. and he said, most of like the side characters are based on people in his life. So people of bridge four and other people, uh, Mostly shout outs to people in his life, which is really fun. There's a term for it. Do you know this term of getting like put into a book? I oh, don't yeah. know. Um, it had to do with Tucker. Like maybe a guy called Tucker was put in a book and they've called like the competition Tuck Me In, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Um, so, yeah, look, maybe uh, maybe you should enter, Jimmy, and we'll see you in the next book. 
I, I would be very curious of what kind of role he would have me play in the Stormlight Archive. I don't think it would be uh, anything major, unfortunately. I well, the with the name Jimmy Stormblessed, you've shot pretty high. See, with Christian Kremling, he could easily sneak me in. You just got to like the Kremling um, skittered with a strange accent to its clicking. <laughs> and that's me, the Australian Kremling. Um, and then we get a little bit about Sigzul here. Um, like we get acknowledgement that Kaladin met Hoyd. He's like, uh, so who's that Hoyd guy? And Sigzul's like, I don't want to talk about it. So there's an acknowledgement that Kaladin at least went back to the camp, was like, hey, this dude like said he knew you. Um, and Sigzul just kept it quiet. So beyond that, there's the good character moments of Teft and Moash. Shout out to Leighton and uh, Sigzul, I suppose. But this was more of like a, um epilogue to the last chapter. That's what I felt like. A bit of a calm before the storm, no pun intended. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. But uh, I'm telling you, mate, I got nothing else on these chapters. Yeah, I think that honestly is kind of a two sim- more simple, straightforward chapters for the most part here. And uh, I think it's time to move into a span read Ooh, that we got. Let's and- do it. Yeah, the Stormfather was mentioned in the first Kaladin chapter, by the way, whenever they're talking about the glyphs. So I thought that this would be a good one to read. And it is titled Dead Eyeing the Stormfather. Dear Mr. Kremling and Mr. Stormblast. I'm a longtime listener from Norway. I started reading Stormlight Archive at the very beginning of 2023 and finished binging the books last summer. So you really uh, so you really started your podcast at the perfect time for me. Listening to the newest episode of Lost in Roshar while walking the dog really brightens on my Monday mornings. Well, I'm super oh, glad cool. that you and the pup uh, are enjoying the show. Thank you. Uh, it says, after watching Lost in Discovery's videos about Stormlight Archive ending a while back, I started to think about the Night of Sorrows and Stormlight possibly disappearing. And some pieces fell into place in my head, but no guarantee that they are the right places. I like the humility here. This yeah. is good. <laughs> Okay, so remember when Dalinar hurt the Stormfather while forcing him to become something Shardblade S to escape through Jock Kaved's Oathgate? Oh. Remember how a snippy honor spren and lasting integrity la- uh, later refers to that when budding in at Adolin's trial to whine, oh my god, did you even know that your dad almost killed the Stormfather? And remember <laughs> when the Stormfather screams in pain when Ishar tries to steal Dalinar's bond. You know... Mm-hmm. I think this might be what's the cool kids call foreshadowing. Oh, I think we, uh, yeah, this is a good one. Yeah. I think we all strongly suspect that something very, very bad is going to happen at the contest of champions in book five. And I think that it is also going to end up dead eyeing the storm father. I think Dalinar is either going to be tricked into breaking his oath really hard or Dalinar will lose and Odium will snap the storm father's bond when forcing Dalinar to become his servant, basically killing the storm father with recoil of the bond. With the Stormfather as a dead eye, the High Storms may no longer be charged with Stormlight, making it unavailable to the Radiance. If the Sun in Shadesmar is a representation of the Stormfather or Honor's power, which mostly resides in the Stormfather, the Sun might go down. While we've nice. been seeing like from Adolin Shardblade's spread that dead eyes might be possible to revive, I think it's safe to say that the effects of the Stormfather being dead eyed would be very bad. Indeed. Best wishes, Alan Viggen. Alan, thank you so very much. Uh, also, the way they, they spell Alan is very interesting. Well, it's pronounced, I should say it's pronounced Alan, but it's actually, uh, it looks like Erland, but it's Alan. Oh, yeah. pronounced pretty- Alan, spelled Erland. Cool. Uh, listen, Christian, this, this, this checks a lot of boxes for me. Uh, because I think that we've been talking about how Dalinar is not safe. I really do like the idea of him being broken down. Like the second half of that, that those options is better mm. for me. So he, uh, Odium winning, Dalinar having to bend, become the servants, rebound, whiplash, kills Stormfather. And me and you have talked about that sun setting and how it's hinted at throughout this first book. Mo- I mean, how many times have we talked about it? So many times. Yeah, so many times. And we times. know that there are scenes that are hinted at in the chapter title pictures. And there's yep. one where it looks like the sun is going down in shades Mar. And if that is the representation of the sun in shades Mar, then I honestly think Alan might have just solved us the end of book five. I really, I've never heard about, I've never heard a dead eye storm father situation before. So that's very new to me. I, love I really, this. I really like it. I remember the storm father screaming in pain when Ishar tries to steal the bond and a few of those other moments. 
but the one about him trying to make the Stormfather a blade is a bit hazy to me. I'd love to reread that that portion and that the honest friend knew about it. They're like, what did you do that for? Um, I think this, this needs to be a uh, Lost in Discovery video. <laughs> yeah, maybe you need to do a um, Stormfather-themed ep. That could be fun. Um, but yeah, like I always have um, been on team No Stormlight after book five, mm-hmm. and the Storm provides Stormlight. So naturally, I should have come to this conclusion that the Stormfather is in big trouble, right? Mm-hmm. And I like the idea of a dead eye or that Odium takes over the storm and like the storm's his weapon or something and he makes it the void light <laughs> archive or something like that. I think dead eye is a bit more interesting in, as opposed to evil Stormfather. I like it. I like it because I think the battle will go wrong. The contest will go so damn wrong. And uh, the world, as we know it, will end to some degree. Mm-hmm. And look, some people have got to be cut. That We need some big losses at the end of this book. And you know what? Uh, I'll, I'll say this. The, the, um, the prologue of book five does have an emphasis on the Stormfather, which could be seeds planted for a Stormfather death. Yes. At the end of the book. So, yeah, I mean, great theory. This is really good stuff. I think yeah. it is one clever, two makes sense, and I think it also makes the story better for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, yeah. The sun, though, the sun setting. I love hearing about that because I love just like the the shades my sun stuff. I don't know if it's a representation of honor. Well, I don't know what it is. That's the biggest question. What is this sun, and why is it slowly setting? Who knows? Um, I think it will go out. I'm con- I like the Dead Eye Spren honor. I don't know if it's going to connect to the sun, but I hope so. I hope so. If I want the, the sun, sun and Shades Mar is, so that's the question. If it is a representation of Stormfather or Honor's power, which is mostly residing in Stormfather now. So I think that that's the part mm. that maybe, maybe, we're, maybe we're going a little far. I just really love the idea of this because like it is like something's going down with the sun. I mean, something is happening <laughs> with the sun, guys. Like it has to. Yeah, there's no, there's no. There's no question about it, whether it's this book or, or f- further down the line, I suppose we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I suppose like with Roshar going through so much turmoil, we haven't really thought about what that would look like in Shadesmar. You know, yeah. how, how is that going to represent itself? Yeah, um, it's going to be a huge issue. I mean, like there's no way it doesn't affect, like whatever happens in book five is drastically going to affect Shadesmar. The thing is, right, like, with, there's been a big focus on dead eyes, especially in the last book with um, Adolin's shard blade kind of waking up. Mm-hmm. So it'd be interesting to see if all these old dead eyes come back to life, but we lose the Stormfather or something crazy like that. That would be very cool. I'd like yeah. to see that. So yeah, I support this theory. So Still. I'm going to ask you a quick question. Yeah. Will you feel disappointed if Odium doesn't win at the end of book five? Like what if what if the Radiance, like there's a huge cost to pay for it, but like they mm-hmm. actually end up defeating Odium? I'd be disappointed, yeah. Because I want Odium to be a huge big bad, not even just in Rosha. I want Odium to go crazy. I want Taravangian to like kill the characters in Mistborn Era 3. That's what I want. You know? <laughs> so like I want him to I fully support tower of engine to make this a thematically exciting universe and it's just too yeah. early man he just got the shard tower of engine is my favorite <laughs> brandon sanderson character so i am team odium team terra odium whatever yeah i'm all for it and he's and he's frontliner will be blackthorn can you imagine dude the blackthorn coalesces into elantris too and he's like get oh. out of here play <laughs> He summons Oathbringer and he's just taking names. Come Dude, on. Dude, it, it could be pretty epic. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. It would be so good to see Evil Dalinar show up. It's like, you think, hey, you know, know hey, evil subjective, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's got righteous cause. Yeah. Yeah. If he's in power, I'm rooting for him. Okay. <laughs> Dude, can you imagine? And it's like, then, then there's this whole, like, there's just so much rich history between these characters like from Taravang you get his little mean, portrait done in Carbranth to this give me that that's way better than like oh no I couldn't save Carbranth yes Shalan you did it you bested me no not yet anyway 
I, oh, yeah. I I am starting to get this little feeling that Ooh. the end of book five might not be as catastrophic as we think it is. No, stop that. Ignore I that. I think with feeling. that big gap, though, I think with yeah. that big gap between the books coming out, I don't know if he'd want to leave us on such a downer. Not a downer. It will be like, oh, we just made it. Odium, we like we we kicked Odium out of the playground. He's got to f- bully some other kids. Let's regroup, and Odium will be back eventually. Like that's the vibe I get. You know, hmm. they'll yeah. deter him, but not defeat him. That's what I'm gonna say. Yeah, that that's kind of what, that's kind of what I mean. Like, because okay. I'm I'm imagining like a full sweep. Odium wins, and then there's some silver <laughs> linings. But I'm starting to think it's going to be more of like a bittersweet victory. Yeah, like a Pyrrhic victory. Um, mm-hmm. I, like Stormlight is all about hope, mm-hmm. which is also why I've enjoyed it, because basically everything I've been into, <laughs> Jimmy's Jimmy's booing me silently, <laughs> but uh, everything I've enjoyed up until Stormlight in my life basically is like, oh, the bad guys won, life is terrible, um, existential crisis. And I like Stormlight's a bit of a new thing for my taste. And I quite like that I have something that gives me hope. So I don't know whether I'm just being influenced by my taste that I want a bit of a downer ending. Um, but I think it will be the most severe ending out of all of the endings. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah there's no doubt about that. And I do think even if it a, is a victory, and we live the fight another day. I think the cost will be great. Yeah, I want I want people to die for real in this book because it's like the one piece thing of like, is anyone really dead? Um, Which can be very interesting, but like, I think the way Teft was taken out was extremely good for the story, you know? Mm -hmm. So I hope we get some of those. Although a lot of the main characters, I feel like there's work to be done. Like Adolin, he could die, but I'm like, I'd be a bit like, is that all we had for Adolin? I want a bit more. I I don't think Adolin's going to die. Yeah. Like, uh, do you think any of the mainline guys are going to die in this book? Mm. What do you consider mainline? Like A and B, like POV characters and their and their best friends, I suppose. I mean, <laughs> like, Dalinar is, of course, possible. I think I think Dalinar is going to go through a massive transformation some way mm. uh, or die. But like Shallan, Kaladin and Adolin are fine. Yeah, I, I think, think those, those three make it all the way through the entire series, probably. Yeah, but they might become more background. Um, I think you this think? might well, like Kaladin will be like um, huge beard, gray hair. Kaladin, that's that's what's coming. Uh, Shalan will be like the new Hoid, and Adolin. There's Adolin's. A, I'm a little bit lost on where he's going with Adolin. I don't know where he's going with that. Because there's a lot of interesting sort of questions that come up with Adolin's character, like when everyone's so, a superhero and you used to be the best, like all this stuff, his relationship with Shalant, what's going to happen, Jimmy? So Tell here's me. here's one of the things that I think is a strong point for Adolin is that like he is, he is significant because he's insignificant, meaning that he's not a radiant. Like because he's actually one of the only people who aren't, he's actually significant for that reason. And I felt this way about Elend in Mistborn. Yeah. And then Elen became special and super powery. And yeah. I actually didn't like that. I actually preferred it when he wasn't. So I'm a little afraid that somehow we're going to roundabout way, get the Adolin doing these things. And <laughs> I'm going to be like, ah, through, through like talking about some other stuff. I've got a new line of thought for, for Adolin, which kind of makes him special already. Um, which is to do with his mom. So his mom is from Erie. She's Iriali. And if you go down the rabbit hole of Iriali people, which I did because in, in a new preview chapter they're mentioned or featured, you've, you know that they're not actually from Ashen like the rest of the humans. They're from somewhere else. Like they came to Roshar some other way. Oh, man. So like he's half that. And what does that mean? Um, so that, that could be interesting. And especially because we've got hints that they'll be somewhat important. I thought, okay, that's a that's a new line of maybe he'll like discover his mum's heritage and be like, Shalan, I need to I need to follow this path instead mm-hmm. of go with you to you know Mistborn Era Seven. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. But I think I think not enough people will die. But I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. 
We just want we just want death and destruction. Apparently, <laughs> I, I just want real stakes. You know, I yeah. want yeah. real stakes, and I appreciate. Look, I appreciate the hope. Keep, keep the hope. Keep the people can change. All of that, but show me how um, how much of a threat Tarabangian with like ultimate power is, because I think that's yeah. very interesting to explore. Yeah, I, I'm in a complete agreement with you. Yeah. Um, short and snappy this week, I think, but um, rich with rich with good discussion. Do you have anything more to say? No, I think that's about it for uh, for this week. Uh, you know, just every time I open up our, my way of kings to do these, I'm like, man, we're almost done. We're yeah, so close. We're almost there, man. He's about to say the words, the words, <laughs> Kaladin. Uh, um, we're close. In two episodes, we'll be reading that chapter, the chapter that made me cry and made me fall in love with the series. So I'm excited hey. to to do that nice. um but as always guys thank you for accompanying us on this episode of lost in rosha remember the most important chapter a man can read is the next one we'll see you next week as we dive into chapter 64 and 65 and if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast be sure to leave us a review on whichever platform you listen on uh, and if you have any questions or theories span read us at lost in at gmail.com we'll see you next time on lost in Roshar. remember to keep that safe hand covered